There is nothing so important to a good movie as a great script, and we've long avoided picking our favorites out of sheer intimidation at the size of the task, but today we screw our courage to the sticking place. These are our picks for the 10 best screenplays of all time. Let's begin with the obvious. Nothing says good writing like a bunch of characters saying the good writing. Great dialogue is often the first symptom of a fantastic script. Whether it feels so um, organic and, and, and natural with all the beautiful spontaneity of a piece of inspiration plucked from the raw moment like in Manchester by the Sea, My Dinner with Andre, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, or the Before Trilogy or distilled into crackling quippery, like a rapid-fire repartee that would fill even staircase wit with envy, like in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, Juno, in Bruges, Glengarry Glen Ross, and the Lady Eve. It's hard to pass up the blistering banter of His Girl Friday and the shaggy dog delights of Pulp Fiction, but for us, there's something extra special about the wickedness of film noir gangsterdom channeled through the off-kilter typewriter ribbons of the Coen brothers in Miller's Crossing. What the hell's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? Fried people might get the right idea? Leo's got the right idea. I like him. He's honest and he's got a heart. Then it's true what they say. Opposites attract. Do me a favor, mind your own business. This is my business. Intimidate and help his women is part of what I do. And find one an intimidator. The tale of a man caught between warring Prohibition era crime bosses, Miller's Crossing is a stylistic gumbo of influences and inspiration that sees the Coen brothers use and abuse language to a level that asks to be compared with the bard. They send absurd wordplay like take your flunky and dangle, Mr. Inside Outski, and what's the rumpus skating past their characters' teeth without sacrificing an ounce of bite. Even the stupid characters are brilliantly so, blathering on with a kind of bone headed poetry that shortly took hours of laborious craft. And it's not just that each character banters with the pinpoint precision of an insult comic, or that they all have their own unique style of cracking wise, or even that every conversation feels like a verbal shootout. It's that there's a third kind of something special in each exchange that comes not from any one of its participants, but out of the amorphous alchemy of the interlocking back and forth that rings like musical harmony off the page. Drop dead. On the opposite side of the very same coin, other screenplays distinguish themselves with the quality of their action. Now, we don't just mean car chases and fight scenes, although those can certainly be part of it. We mean all those things that move a plot forward that don't directly come from someone flapping their jaw. It's the genius of taking a heady internal concept like the desire to live life as if one were storied character actor John Malkovich and rendering it physical by conjuring up a literal portal into his subconscious. Ocean's Eleven, Misery, Fight Club, Spaceballs, Raiders of the Lost Ark, West Side Story, and Seven Samurai all soar on the backs of scripts that brilliantly arrange narrative movement through space. But look no further than the silent era for some of the best examples of this kind of writing. Charlie Chaplin built an entire career on storytelling through things other than dialogue out of necessity. But for us, there is perhaps no better example of this than the immense tension conjured up just the other side of the silent era in M. Just a few short years after the introduction of sound, M sees master director Fritz Lang teaming up with Germany's preeminent pen, Thea von Harbo, to bring the best of silent cinema to one of its first talkies. And while some of its memorable moments are rendered in speech, many more are contoured in visual grammar. Eerie whistling, threatening proximity, and shadow play in this hushed sojourn through a noirish world. And it is a story designed around action when missing children cause an increase in police scrutiny, an entire criminal underworld teams up with the law to apprehend the man responsible in order to ease the pressure on their own racketeering. The stakes are built around looking, seeing, finding, discovering, and avoiding discovery, such that the cleverness often reserved for the spoken word is found instead in the spatial world. In place of puns, positioning. In place of disclosure, discovery. In place of repartee, there is instead a very literal back and forth, and it is no less a work of great writing for it. 
It's a mistake to think that all there is to screenwriting is what's on the page. Yes, those words are the part of the iceberg you get to see, but they're held up by ten times that amount in story bibles and backstory, behind the scenes and below the waterline. This is world building. The Wizard of Oz, Lawrence of Arabia, Mad Max, Avatar, and Spirited Away all conjure up nations, if not planets, if not entirely new dimensions for our minds to roam. While Goodfellas, Almost Famous, Sunset Boulevard, Dazed and Confused, all teleport us to a moment in space and time we can almost smell. But it's not just the universe creation that's the tricky stitch. A great screenplay also has to pack it all down into 120 pages. It's an enormous forest built from a very small cluster of trees. Think of how Her builds an entire sci-fi future out of mostly just an apartment. Or how the original Star Wars felt like it took place in an entire galaxy even though you only ever see four planets. All of these screenplays brought you stories built atop pie of unseen creativity, but none more than the one built upon literal tomes. We're talking here about the endless appendices beneath the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring. The world is changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. Much that once was is lost. For none now live who remember it. Opening with a piece of legend that hints at a fantasy world rich with history, the first five minutes make a promise that the rest of the movie continually keeps. Beginning in humble Hobbiton, only to incrementally reveal layer after layer of rich detail. And, taken together, those details suggest a totality much grander than the singular narrative we're privy to. As if the world were far bigger than we could ever hope to see, only hinted at in the ruins of a hilltop fort, the rooms of a border town inn where humans and hobbits live side by side. And the held tongues of a simmering racial tension in the council room of a hidden haven. All of these point outwards to so much more world beyond the narrow boundaries of our little story. To fabled halls only our imaginations will ever explore. Because the world doesn't exist for these characters, they just happen to exist in it. And while it's tempting to say the screenwriting here was no real accomplishment, to accuse Fran and Peter of just coloring over the Mona Lisa with tracing paper, remember that Tolkien had way more space. There is undeniable art to it, and, let's be honest, history has proven that rich Tolkien source material is far from enough to guarantee a good script. Alongside the external expansiveness of world building is the internal vastness of characterization, the evocation of an entire human being in little more than the length of a first date. And these aren't novels. There's no place to describe a person or tell an audience about their headspace. Screenwriting is the domain of speech and action, and character building for the screen is an exercise in revealing internal states through what people say and do. In some screenplays, this looks like an ultra-detailed character study of a single person, as in Patton, Sideways, the Piano, Malcolm X, Amadeus, Raging Bull, and Dog Day Afternoon, where other scripts juggle nearly dozens of individuals with no loss of specificity, as in Boogie Nights, The Royal Tenenbaums, Little Miss Sunshine, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and The Big Chill. It's hard for us not to pick Fargo here, that writing is astounding, but if we didn't limit the Coen brothers to one slot, they'd try to take over this whole list. But we're in luck this time, because we have no qualms passing over Fargo for our next pick, All About Eve. Don't get up. And please stop acting as if I were the queen mother. I'm sorry I didn't Outside mean... of a beehive, Margot, your behavior would hardly be considered either queenly or motherly. You're in a beehive, pal, didn't you know? We're all busy little bees, full of stings, making honey day and night. Aren't we, honey? Margot, really? Please don't play governess, Karen. I haven't your unyielding good taste. The story of a brash but aging Broadway star who takes on a young fan as her assistant only to find that the young woman increasingly mirrors the famous actress in all the best and most concerning ways. All About Eve is a story about character, about modeling, replicating, understanding, and becoming. Its brilliant wit conceals the duplicitous motives found in the gap between the character's stated intentions and their real actions, which is the perfect playground for a screenplay about aging stars and rising starlets. The film cemented Betty Davis's legend. Normally notorious for changing lines at a whim, it's said that she adored the script and her character so much that every single word proceeded unscathed from the page to the screen. 
exposition is a dirty word when it comes to the screenplay. Screenwriters should be showing, not telling, doing, not saying, and God help them if they ever use any voiceover. God help you if you use voiceover in your work, my friends. God help you. But at the end of the day, audiences eventually need to know something in order to understand what the hell is going on. So another mark of a great screenplay is how subtly and effortlessly it gets across information. How it tells you things you need to know by first making you want to know them. How it paces and parses and parcels out the pieces of the plot for maximum impact and effect. Think of screenplays like The Prestige, Knives Out, All the President's Men, and LA Confidential that keep you balanced on the cusp of understanding and curiosity, peeling back their layers in an almost irresistible striptease of a story. Or films like The Third Man, The Sting, Old Boy, and Psycho that specialize in distracting you with their left hand while they rip the rug out from under you with their right. Rear Window is an absolute masterclass in visual exposition, but we think it's outscored in degree of difficulty by the surrealistic, multi-threaded, internal, external smorgasbord of our number six pick, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Joel. Mm -hmm. I have another idea for this problem. This is a memory of me. The way mm -hmm. you wanted to have sex on the couch after you looked down on my crotch. What? Joel, the eraser guys are coming here, so what if you take me somewhere else? Somewhere where I don't belong? and we hide there till morning. Among his many skills on full display throughout Eternal Sunshine's revolutionary screenplay, above all else, Charlie Kaufman wields a clear mastery over his audience's understanding. His is a story of a man erasing his memories of an ex-girlfriend who has already done the same to hers of him while one of the memory erasers tries to woo her and use his access to her subconscious to his advantage while another of the memory erasement workers tries to seduce his memory eraser co-worker who also finds out that she had the procedure done after a failed relationship with the memory erasionist doctor. Confused? You weren't when you watched the movie, because the details are parceled out with a lot more care than we took. Every additional piece of complexity isn't just something we're told and have to keep track of, it's something we discover in the most delightfully peculiar of circumstances. Never too much all at once and never too little, always just enough to keep us wondering as we tumble onwards into our next discovery the entire film long. Facts are good and all, but what about feelings, you say? Well, we all go to a lot of therapy here at Cinefix, so now you're talking our language. Creating, evoking, and managing tone. The prevailing mood in a piece of storytelling is an underrated and oft underappreciated part of screenwriting that can make the difference between a solid piece of pulp and an unforgettable Oscar winner. What would Lost in Translation be without a sense of hollow loneliness in every scene? Or Amelie without whimsy around every corner? There will be blood booms with a violent intensity on every page. Network howls with a sense of righteous fury, and the graduate seeps on we from its every slug line. Apocalypse Now, Big Fish, No Country for Old Men, Moonlight, and Do the Right Thing all carry a unique emotional posture in what seems like every typewritten letter, but there is no master of tone like the legendary Paul Schrader, particularly in our next pick, Taxi Driver. <laughs> This has followed me my whole life, everywhere. Bars and cars, sidewalks, stores, everywhere. There's no escape. And God's the only man. Paul Schrader, who literally wrote the book on the power of tone, uses Taxi Driver to tell the tale of a bitter outsider to society, turning to violence in hopes of giving his life a sense of purpose when all else fails. He gambled on an extremely unlikable protagonist in the belief that he could win us over by positioning them inside of his sense of alienation. And oh, how it works. Spending nearly as much time on the page soaking in the Manhattan downpour as moving the plot forward, the screenwriting steeps the viewer in the hollow murder of loneliness. Schrader writes more like a prosaic novelist than a terse Hollywood scribe, introducing characters with lines like, he seems to have wandered in from a land where it is always cold, a country where the inhabitants seldom speak. The head moves, the expression changes, but the eyes remain ever fixed, unblinking, piercing empty space. And there is little doubt that the energy he brings to the page ended up ultimately on the screen.
While tone is over here talking about its feelings and vibe, our next criteria, theme, won't shut up about its point of view. For your below average screenplay, it's probably a heavy hitting hot take like war is bad or family is important. But for the artsy fartsy stuff we tend to go for, things get a little more amorphous. Personally, we think the best themes are often those you can't put on a t-shirt. If it were simple enough to make a pithy phrase and be sold at Hot Topic, the writer probably would have had a much easier time screen printing than screen writing. So yes, in the loosest possible sense, Parasite and Modern Times wrestle with capitalism. The Seventh Seal and It's Such a Beautiful Day tangle with mortality. Synecdoche, New York and Eight and a Half engage with art and purpose. The Best Years of Our Lives and Stand By Me look at loss. Three Colors Red and Magnolia touch on connection. To Kill a Mockingbird and A Few Good Men lock horns with justice. But for our next pick, we don't think there's a screenplay that managed to be so rich and complex while also striking such an unarticulated universal chord and so recently as Jordan Peele's thematic codex, Get Out. Gordon was a professional golfer for years. Oh, you kidding? Well, I can't quite swing the hips like I used to, though. But uh, I do know Tiger. Is it true? Is it better? Wow, wow. Wow! Fair skin has been in favor for the past, what, couple of hundreds of years? But now the pendulum is swung back. Black is in fashion. If you somehow don't remember, Jordan Peele's horror story of a young black man's first meeting with his white girlfriend's parents that goes just about as insanely wrong as it possibly could burst out of absolutely nowhere. As an actor turned director with a history of mostly just sketch comedy, great sketch comedy, but sketch comedy nonetheless, he took on what seemed like the entirety of black and white race relations in America and absolutely knocked it out of the park. Get Out was notable for how seamlessly it tied its theme into every stitch of every scene. With big ideas woven into the thread of every jump scare and punchline, Peel mined the veins of his story vehicle for humor, for horror, for drama, and most of all, for meaning. The film ultimately explored a rich and twisted variety of ways that racism can hide behind the facade of polite liberal society, but also the complicated manner in which hatred and dehumanization get tangled up with other less frequently discussed features of prejudice like envy, desire, and fetishism. It rendered clear, frightening, and weirdly hilarious how those things are far from opposite. Get Out's biting satire draws complex connections between all manner of details of the black experience in modern upper-class America. And to try to distill the theme down into one sentence is to necessarily sell short a brilliant story done right. As we arrive at our top three, we'd be kicking ourselves if we didn't take a slot to appreciate the power of a really great idea. The high concept screenplay, the story you can pitch in a 20 word blog line that immediately makes you go, my God, I wish I thought of that. Something so interesting, so unusual, and so compelling that it immediately demands exploration. It's Will Shakespeare having one of his own romances while writing Romeo and Juliet. It's another of the Bard's plays set in a modern day California high school, a student competing with a parent for the love of his teacher. It's a young man obsessed with suicide falling in love with a much older woman. It's what if the cast of Star Trek had to actually pilot a spaceship? What if a crew of a spaceship were trapped aboard with an alien monster? What if toys were alive when we weren't looking? What if two musicians had to masquerade as women to skip town after witnessing a crime and then fell in love? And it's our number three pick, the Wachowski sisters. What if everything around us, this entire world, was a bad dream? And what if you could wake up? This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the Matrix. This is the world as it exists today. Very few stories have had such a lasting impact on a culture in the last century as the Wachowski's Matrix. It is the perfect high concept screenplay. The deeper you mine each idea, the more gold you find. There's rogue programs, quirks in the code, glitches in the Matrix, freed individuals who would do anything to go back into comfortable slavery. Each next idea asks a fascinating question and answers it with another great idea. It continually makes good on the promise of the premise, cashing every check written by the Grand Central conceit, which is really something considering how vast a world and idea they set out to explore. 
And what's all the more fascinating is how this concept and the philosophy it engages with has grown only more interesting in time with the progression of both technology and the authors. What once seemed like just a meditation on dissatisfaction with modern life has grown to take on expanded meaning in the last few decades, as the Wachowski sisters have grown into themselves, enriching the story while still retaining all of its vast initial appeal. Closing in at number two, it's time we talk about conflict and drama. It's the gas in the tank, the fuel for the fire. It's what turns a long morning chat over a nice glass of milk into a nail-biting, eyeball-grabbing attention vacuum. Somebody wants something and there's an obstacle in their way. Maybe it's another person. Maybe it's a force of nature. Maybe it's society itself. But the result is tension, conflict, the very recipe for an unforgettable scene. It happens when two people lock horns and refuse to let go, as in a separation, election, double indemnity, high noon, and high and low. Or when they're forced into a situation they would very much like to get out of, as in when Harry met Sally, On the Waterfront, Shawshank Redemption, and Schindler's List. It even happens when they're divided against themselves, as in Call Me By Your Name, Before Sunrise, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, A Brief Encounter, and In the Mood for Love. The Godfather is an ingenious study of almost every single kind of conflict, but for this slot, we're going with the dramatic conflict that arises from one person planning themselves in place and refusing to be moved, as in Whiplash, Cool Hand Luke, and our number two pick, Twelve Angry Men. Just remember that this has to be twelve to nothing either way. Um, that's the law. Okay, are we ready? Uh, all those voting guilty, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, that's eleven guilty. All those voting not guilty? One, right. Eleven guilty, one not guilty. Well, now we know where we are. Boy, oh boy, there's always one. <laughs> As clear an example of opposing forces as ever forged a story, Twelve Angry Men sees a jury tasked with deciding the fate of a young man accused of murdering his father who have unanimously voted him guilty but for one lone man, juror number eight. And it works as well as it does because a vehicle for conflict is built into the entire scenario. The decision requires a unanimous vote, which means any one holdout can hang the whole endeavor. It's 90 unbroken minutes in the jury's chambers, with a little movement and almost no action and yet it thunders with the energy of a battlefield. And that's because they are doing battle, pitting their wills against one another, channeled through rhetoric rather than violence. Juror number eight digs in his heels in the name of the truth, but by offering himself up for a fight, he forces each of the other jurors to reveal the real motivations, driving them to stand against him. Laziness, thoughtlessness, conformity, prejudice, personal baggage, one by one, the battle lines are drawn, and 12 Angry Men's screenplay leads the charge. Finally, finishing things off with our number one slot, there's hardly a screenwriting guru, professor, or working professional alive who wouldn't agree with the statement that screenwriting is structure. It's not just the words on the page, it's the manner in which they're arranged that matters most. How the scenes build into sequences that propel you through acts. How the different threads commingle and intertwine and then arrive together at a singular climactic point. It's the streamlined perfection of three-act masterpieces like The Fugitive, Aaron Brockovich, Witness, Michael Clayton, and Back to the Future. It's the crystalline order found in the non-linear chaos of the social network, Groundhog Day, Rashomon, Memento, Annie Hall, and Citizen Kane. And it's the long, winding roads that lead you to a destination somehow both inevitable and unexpected from It Happened One Night, The Silence of the Lambs, The Handmaiden, and our number one pick, could it be anything else? Forget it, guys. It's Chinatown. Bad for glass. Yeah, sure. Bad for the glass.
Chinatown's 70s modernization of the film noir follows P.I. Jake Giddies as he is inadvertently sucked into a scintillating conspiracy riptide of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power infringing upon the riparian rights of the Central Valley farmers with their latest aqueduct. Sounds fascinating, but my god, does it work. Have you ever seen a really beautiful person with a terrible haircut? Like a god-awful mullet, and they manage to somehow still look fantastic on account of having a perfect bone structure, to the point they can make a rat tail seem chic? That's Chinatown and water rights. Yeah, it sounds like a terrible topping, but the bones are flawless and you can't help but stare. Every beat is paced to perfection. Every payoff set up ages earlier, but you'd never know it. Every character comes back in a meaningful way, but they never make the world feel small. Every scene, every detail, every line of dialogue is a part of a grander mystery that pulls Jake in and us with him on a downward spiral of entanglement, wrapping us up in an increasingly perilous plot that crisscrosses from the personal to the political, drawing us deeper for a different reason every act before spitting us out in the perfect ending we should have expected but never saw coming. Sid Field, perhaps the original screenwriting guru, declared it the perfect screenplay. Perfect is a scary word, but we don't think he's too far from wrong. Chinatown is undeniably one of the greatest screenplays of all time. So, what do you think? Disagree with any of our picks? Did we leave out any of your favorite screenplays? There's got to be at least three we forgot to mention. Let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more Cinefix movie lists.